thanks for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sergei Kryzminski. Um, he is an assistant professor at UC San Diego, and he did his PhD with Simon Levin, and then did postdocs with, um, with Joshua Pl Plotkin and Michael Desai. What I really like about his work is its breadth. Um, he works on anything from phylogenetics and influenza virus to um, yeah. <laughs> phylogenetics and influenza virus to uh, experimental evolution in yeast. And um, I also really admire how he combines uh, deep theoretical ideas with clever high throughput experiments. So I'm sure we'll see a good example of that today. Um, and please join me in welcoming Sergey. Well, thanks a lot, Danny, and, and uh, thank you all the students who invited me here. It's a, it's a real pleasure to share my work with you. So the ability to evolve is a fundamental property of living systems. So I use this line as an introduction to many proposals now, uh, and I, of course, meant all living systems on Earth, but actually just this year, earlier this year, I realized that the statement is actually much more profound. So imagine that we encountered some extraterrestrial life. So the biochemistry or the chemistry of, this, of these uh, aliens might be completely different from what we have here, but the populations of these beings would still be subject to the same forces of evolution as we are here on Earth, right? Natural selection, mutation, and genetic drift, and possibly some other forces which are not as universal. So evolutionary biology uh, here back on Earth tries to understand how, the, how these forces, how these evolutionary forces shaped the diversity of life in the past. But um, one hallmark of success of science is the ability to predict future changes. So if, you, if we understand the evolutionary process as well, we should be able to make predictions about how systems will evolve in the future. And that's currently not the case. So I think the new challenge, of course, you know, there's still lots of challenges here, but a new challenge for evolutionary biology, at least as I see it, is to try to make it a predictive discipline. So try to make predictions about how populations will evolve in the future. And this is a kind of a broad question. And let me just give you two examples of, of more specific questions where this might be relevant. So for example, we all know about climate change, and it would be very nice to be able to predict which population, let's say, of coral reefs will be able to adapt to these changes in the climate, and which ones, which ones will not. Or take antibiotic resistance. Right? It's obviously a major problem, and we would very much like to know, if you introduce a new antibiotic into the market, we would like to know what kind of mechanisms of resistance will evolve and how long it would take. So right now, we really can't tackle this question, these questions. So why is it so difficult to make predictions about evolution? Uh, so let me, and I think there are many reasons, but I think the kind of the fundamental reason has to do with the structure of fitness landscapes. So let me give you, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of people here know what fitness landscapes are, but let me just give you a very uh, brief intro in, in, into fitness landscapes. So imagine that we have an organism and we can, uh, which has a particular uh, size of a genome. And imagine sort of all possible genomes that can encode this organism. So those will be represented schematically as a two-dimensional space. Of course, the actual space of all genomes is very large, not two-dimensional. And uh, in a simplest case, each genome has a particular value of reproductive success in this current environment, so fitness. And so this mapping from the space of genomes onto fitness gives us uh, a fitness landscape, sort of a, a, sh a shape, a surface. So the major difficulty, or one of the major difficulties in, in predicting evolution, oh, I should say also, just, just, to, just to be really clear, uh, as I said, each individual is a, is a point in the space because each individual has a particular genome, and the population would be sort of a cloud of points that's, that lives in this landscape. And what evolution does generally is push these populations towards values of higher fitness, right? So the, the, the major difficulty in, in making predictions about evolution, how evolution will unfold, is that 
we really don't know how these fitness landscapes look like. What is the shape of these landscapes? And we also have um, not really a great idea of how populations move on them. So this is sort of a sec secondary question. Of course, on top of this fundamental complication, there is, you know, if you're, tri if you're trying to study evolution in, in natural systems, uh, there is additional complications, right? There is ecology, there is spatial structure, uh, there's you know, gene flow, all, all kinds of complications that, that sort of make this um, studying the fitness landscapes difficult. So what we try to do in my lab is to bring evolution into the lab and kind of get rid of all these complications that are in nature and, study, and sort of study uh, fitness landscapes in a more, in a sort of more pristine environment, if you want. So the idea of uh, evolution experiments is actually very simple. So we use microbes. In my lab, we use three different microbes. But the actual experiments are, are very simple. So we uh, create these artificial environments in, in flasks. We fill these flasks with some kind of media. And uh, we let our populations grow in, this, in these environments. After they have uh, grown for some time, we take samples from these uh, dense populations, we transfer them into fresh media, let them grow again, and continue this process for, for weeks or sometimes months. And uh, after a few months, you usually see, we usually observe uh, changes in the genetic composition of the population and phenotypic composition of the population. So evolution does take place in these, in these environments. And there's many nice features about evolution experiments. So one of them, for example, is that you can, have a, you can take samples from these cultures and freeze them. And you can, so thereby you can obtain an entire fossil record of the evolutionary process. You can also uh, directly measure the fit fitness of evolved populations in competition by, so by taking these populations from, sort of from a later evolutionary time point and competing them against the ancestor that was sitting in the freezer. There's lots of other nice, nice bonus features. Um, so using these experiments, what we would like to know, what we would like to learn is what I'm sort of what I'm interested in is learning the uh, statistical structure of fitness landscapes, and I, I, I emphasize this word statistical structure rather than the actual shape of fitness landscape landscapes because, uh, as I said, fitness landscapes are really high dimensional, and for any organism, even for a simplest organism that you can think of, it is going to be impossible to map every single genotype onto fitness. There, it's, it's just not going to be feasible. So what, the only thing that we really can hope to do is to um, try to measure some features, some statistical features of, of these landscapes. For example, sort of we, can, we might be able to measure the average slope and maybe some distribution, typical distribution of slopes in this fitness landscape. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so the first time when I started thinking about this question, sort of how to probe the statistical structure of a fitness landscape was uh, when I started talking to Rich Lansky in my first postdoc. So probably most of you know, uh, this is the person who started, uh, I think now, the most famous evolution experimental evolution experiment. Um, so he, back in 1988, so he started 12 populations of E. coli and he propagated them in exactly the manner that I showed you on the previous slide for now over 30 years. So as of, I think, this Monday, uh, these populations reached 73,000 generations. So a really, really long-term experiment. And uh, there's lots of really interesting things that they came out from this experiment. But what I want to focus on today is just one uh, observation. So as I mentioned, you can measure fitness uh, of these evolved populations. And you can do this over time. Sort of observe how fitness changes over time. And what Rich has observed is that, so here I'm plotting this value of fitness. In, uh, sort of this, this is the competitive fitness of these evolved variants against their direct ancestor. So over time, uh, what you see is that these trajectories in fitness have, they're first of all very repeatable. And second, they have this stereotypical shape. So initially fitness increases rapidly and then it slows down and keeps increasing at much slower pace. So one, uh, when, you, when, you see, when, when you look at this data, and I think that's the first thing that, that came to my mind, uh, is that this repeatability and this shape of, this land, of, of the trajectories probably is explained by uh, sort of a limited number of 
possibilities in which, by which these populations can adapt to this simple environment. So maybe there's just a few ways to adapt and these populations are gradually exhausting all possible beneficial mutations. But recently, these populations have been sequenced and what we see is staggering diversity of mutational trajectories. So these populations, and these are only three of them, uh, these populations are accumulating uh, a variety of mutations in different genes and nevertheless, they are gaining fitness at very similar rates. Of course, there are also mutations that are appearing in multiple populations uh, simultaneously, sort of, uh, in different populations independently. So there is convergent evolution, but the vast majority of mutations are different. So how, how can this diversity of mutations lead to this uh, very repeatable evolution at the level of fitness? Well, so one idea that, that we had now almost 10 years ago, and that, this was really a purely theoretical idea, is that this kind of uh, behavior can be explained by uh, assuming that the effects of mutations, the effects of new beneficial mutations, themselves depend on the fitness of a strain in which they arise. So imagine uh, a distribution of fitness effects. So let's say we're going to plot we're going to sample, hypothetically, all possible beneficial mutations. And we're going to plot their fitness benefits on the x-axis. And we're going to plot a histogram of all these mutations. So that's, that gives us a distribution of fitness effects of these mutations. So this observation of um, diversity of genetic, diversity of mutations and uh, repeatability at the level of fitness could be explained if, if this distri these distribution of fitness effects depended on the fitness itself. So a low fitness strain might have a wider distribution of fitness effects and a high fitness strain might have a low, sort of very narrow distribution of fitness strains, uh, fitness effects. So if this were the case, then we could, then, then these two observations could be reconciled. But of course, um, measuring directly these distributions is very difficult. It was difficult 10 years ago and now it's possible, but it's still very difficult. So what we try to do then, instead of measuring these distributions directly, we try to test uh, sort of indirectly whether uh, fitness of a strain is a good predictor of how rapidly population adapts. So uh, Dan Rice and I set up this experiment in a different system. This is yeast, where we, uh, where we, where we decided to start our evolution experiments with a library of 64 founder strains. So these strains, they differ from each other by uh, roughly 10 mutations, so very closely related. But they also differ from each other by their fitness, so from low fitness to high fitness. And then each of these founders started 10 replicate populations, and we let them grow, propagate in, uh, in, in a particular environment, in the rich media, for 500 generations. So the first thing that we observed is that the fitness of the strain, the, the fitness of the founder, was a very good predictor for the fitness gain that the populations descended from that founder achieved after 500 generations of evolution. So this is a very nice uh, correlation. And we call this the rule of declining adaptability because this kind of uh, pattern has been observed also in, in other systems, for example, in Lenski system. And by the way, if you have any questions, if something is unclear, please uh, just interrupt and, and we can resolve them right away. Okay, so we also sequence these populations. I'm not going to show you the data, but we also observed the diversity of beneficial mutations that drive this adaptation. But then what we did next is, I think, a step towards, towards really connecting the genetic and the fitness information. So we uh, took some of the beneficial mutations that we found and we reconstructed them. We introduced them into founders, into our founders, including those founders where these mutations have never been observed. And so here I'm going to plot, I'm going to show you how the fitness benefits of three beneficial mutations, these are the colored lines, uh, going to change depending on the fitness of the background strain in which they are introduced. The, this, this gray mutation is a control, so it shouldn't change. And so we see that the fitness benefits of the beneficial mutations decrease with the fitness of the strain. So the more fit the strain, the less is the benefit provided by a beneficial mutation. And that's consistent with this idea that the uh, distribution of fitness effects of beneficial mutations is is itself dependent on the fitness of the strain. So basically our interpretation right now uh, is that the fitness landscape has sort of this characteristic uh, structure where the slope is 
higher at lower elevations. And as, you, as the population climbs higher and higher, the slopes become, become shallower and shallower. And so when, when, when we did this experiment, uh, three questions arose, which you know, people asked me when I gave the talks, and we sort of ourselves were, were wondering about. So the first question is, how general is this rule of declining adaptability? Does this hold in different environments? Does it hold at larger genetic distances? Do other mutations exhibit similar kinds of, of uh, epistasis? And by the way, this previous slide um, that I showed you, so this, this we call um, diminishing returns epistasis. And uh, epistasis is just any situation where the effect of mutation changes depending on the genetic background. And this is called diminishing returns because uh, the effect is declining with the, with the fitness of the background strain. And so the three questions were, do, um, and the third question was, do the, uh, 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 the second question was, the, do, do, the, um, do other types of mutations, ex in addition to beneficial mutations that we already sampled, do they exhibit similar kinds of epistasis? And finally, is this kind of epistasis something that we should expect in some sense? Is it something trivial or, or something special about beneficial mutations? Okay, so I will not answer these questions today, but I think we're trying to make some progress along these lines. So, uh, okay, so the one, the first question, right? So how general is this, uh, is this rule of declining adaptability? So uh, remember I mentioned that our founder strains, they are fairly closely related, right? So they are, so this, this kind of picture holds at the scale of about 10 uh, mutations, genetic distances of 10 mutations. It's possible that if we zoomed out and looked at larger genetic distances, let's say you know, tens of thousands of mutations, we might observe something like this, right? So very rugged landscape. Uh, so we decided to test this idea and test this, sort of try to observe the rule of declining capability at, at these larger distances. So, so we started, we sort of basically repeated our previous experiment where now founders where uh, yeast strains that were different, different from each other by tens of thousands of mutations. And I'm not gonna show you the data just in the interest of time, but we observed the rule, that rule of declining capability still holds, so still the um, lower fitness genotypes adapt faster than higher fitness genotypes. And we really see no evidence for, for, for this ruggedness that we kind of potentially expected. Uh, we might, we, we maybe began seeing some evidence for maybe two peaks, but not sort of a, not a, not a large diversity of, of fitness peaks. So, okay, so that's, that's, that's question number one. So, so it looks like this rule of declining adaptability is at least somewhat general. At least, at least it holds in the east at larger genetic distances. So the uh, next question that we wanted to know uh, the answer to is, how do other mutations behave? So we looked so far at beneficial mutations, right? So these, these, these uh, upward arrows. But what about, what about deleterious mutations? So how, does the, how do the statistics of deleterious mutations vary across these positions in, the, in this uh, fitness landscape? In particular, do, they, do these uh, distribution of deleterious effects also depend on fitness? And so to uh, make, to, to sort of to measure this, we came up with uh, a method. It's sort of a, it's not a, it's not a sort of a massive methods development. People have done similar kinds of experiments before. So this is called transpose and metagenesis followed by sequencing, TN-seq. Uh, we, we did a slight modification to this method. Uh, and the point, so kind of the, the important part is that we essentially generated a library of transpose and insertion mutations on plasmids. So each, each plasmid contains a particular insertion and this insertion is linked to a DNA barcode. So we can take this library and we can transform our strain of yeast with this library such that uh, each cell that survives this transformation will get a uh, one insertion mutation and this mutation will be associated with a particular barcode which we, we can then track. And we can do this for all our strains, for multiple strains so that every strain gets exactly the same set of mutations. And so then, because we have uh, these mutations barcoded, we can then track the frequencies 
uh, how the frequencies of these mutations change over time in a competition in this in this in this pool, right? So uh, let's say we look at this orange mutation. So this is this is a barcode that corresponds to one specific mutation. If it increases in the frequency, it means that it is associated with beneficial mutation. And those should be rare in our library because these are random insertions. Uh, most mutations, uh, most mutational trajectories should go down. So what did we see? And this, by the way, this experiment was done by Myla Johnson at Harvard and my student Elena Mertzel, they're both grad students. So uh, what we saw is, is this. So, so here, so let me try to walk you through this data slide. So uh, the x-axis here shows all the uh, 160, roughly 160 founders into which we introduced uh, our mutations. The y-axis shows the effects of these mutations. So they are binned, and the color of each, um, of each little cell re represents the uh, abundance of mutations in that, uh, with that effect, right? So these are histograms. And you can see, sort of, uh, and, and you know, darker colors represent fewer mutations, brighter colors represent more mutations. So what you see is that more fit strains, so there's clear over-representation of more deleterious effects in more fit strains. So another way to look at this data is just to look at the mean effect of a deleterious, or mean effect of a mutation that we introduced. So we see that the mean effect of, a muta of an introduced mutation scales or decreases with the fitness of the founder into which it's introduced, right? So the mutations on average become more deleterious. You can also see that other higher moments of this distribution of fitness effects of mutations also change, right? So they, distribution of fitness effects becomes broader in fitter strains, and it becomes more skewed towards deleterious mutations. Okay, so another way to look at the data, just to sort of really hopefully convince you that uh, this is what's going on, uh, is to track how the effect of every single mutation changes depending on the, on the fitness of the strain into which it's introduced. So here is, for example, Again, the fitnesses, fitnesses of our background strains, and this is the fitness effects of mutations. So sometimes we see, for, for small numbers of mutations, we see that the effects don't change. And by the way, ignore the colors. It's not important at this point. So the some effects of some mutations don't change. They are the same. Some rare mutations have um, an upward slope, so they become less deleterious in fitter strains. But this is, these are a small minority of all mutations that we sampled. So the vast majority of mutations uh, have these negative trends, right? So when the mutation is introduced into a more fit background, it's usually more deleterious. So overall, you see that, uh, so the, by the way, each panel here represents different mutations. And what you see is that the kind of exact pattern is different, it varies between mutations, but the overall trend is, is pretty uh, striking. So if you just calculate the regression slopes between the fitness of the background strain and the effect of a mutation, there is a clear negative, uh, tr negative bias to, for these slopes, right? So most mutations become more deleterious with, with fitness. So we just, we just named this increasing costs epistasis. I don't know if it's a good, good term or not. Uh, so this is, this is what we currently, so this, I think this is my best representation of what we currently know about the fitness landscape of yeast in the lab. Uh, so beneficial mutations become less beneficial as the population climbs the fitness landscape, and deleterious mutations become more and more deleterious as the population climbs the fitness landscape. So evolution sort of, it's, it becomes more and more difficult for a population to climb the landscape, uh, climb, climb in fitness, right? So, okay. So now the next question is, that's been really bothering me for, I don't know, last six or seven years. So is this observation of, of these types of epistasis, is this surprising in some sense? Or is it some really obvious general property of all living systems? And uh, you know, maybe this is just sort of, this is, this is all consistent with Fisher's geometric model or something like that. So, uh, so the question of whether these patterns of epistasis are surprising or, or not surprising is uh, a question about 
what to expect, right? So what kind of what kind of expectations should we have for, for the patterns of epistasis between mutations? I think that's a that's a very difficult question because really we are talking about a cell, right? It's a very complex uh, system. And what we are trying to ask is sort of what should we expect in in you know in these kind of complex systems without really knowing what these complex systems are. Are sort of what, what are the actual features of these land, of, of these complex systems, and so, so in the last uh, few years, I, I've, I've been trying to develop some kind of null expectation for, uh, for for this, and uh, you know you can you can judge whether this is this is successful or not. Um, so, but before I before I tell you what I what I actually did, uh, let me just tr try to show you that this 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 work is relevant not just for evolution, but it's actually probably even more relevant for uh, other kind of, kind of kinds of studies in, that people do, are doing in genetics. So uh, starting in early 2000s, people have begun to systematically measure uh, epistasis between deletion mutations. And they have now, there's now dozens of, of studies that uh, basically look at, uh, uh, sort of they create deletion collections. There are deletion collections available for, for many organisms. Um, a deletion collection is a collection of strains where one gene is deleted. And so then you can create, then you can sort of, by using the deletion collection, you can create a collection of all double mutes. So, so all strains that, or some subset of strains that have uh, all possible combinations are of, of uh, two genes deleted. And so this is, so this is one such study where they've taken, uh, well, so, almost 300,000 uh, pairs of mutations and pairs of genes and deleted, deleted, the, deleted these genes, right? And they looked, at, they looked at how the fitness of the double deletion strain deviates from some kind of prediction of what the fitness should have been given the knowledge of fitnesses of individual mutations. So the sort of the, I, I, okay, so, so yellow indicates that these strains are more fit than they should have been based on the prediction of the, of the single mutants, and these the blue ones are, are less fit. And so people are doing, so this is kind of a, sort of an industry, right? So there's, there's lots of studies that, that uh, generate this kind of data. Um, and so now I think the, one of the latest ones is uh, from 2016, Charlie Boone's lab. So this is now tens of millions of uh, gene deletions, they, they, they screened like this. And what, what uh, these studies usually do is they uh, actually ignore the values of these epistasis coefficients that they, that, they have, that they measured. And what they look at is correlations between the rows of this epistasis metric. So, so this allows them to sort of kind of, but really what they do is, is um, group genes into classes that of genes that are modules, so genes that behave sort of in some sense similarly. And this grouping works very well. So, so you see that genes, all genes that are involved in RNA processing have very similar uh, profiles of epistasis coefficients. What this approach, and this approach is very, it's, it, it works really well. So they really see these nice clusters. The problem is that uh, what, well, at least one thing that, that we're not getting from this kind of data at this point is what are the functional interactions between all these modules. So we see that what the kind of identities of the genes are that belong to each module, but what are the functional interactions between these modules? That's not known. And that really can only come from uh, understanding what the values of this matrix is, not just the correlation between the rows. So we really need, in, this kind of, in these kind of studies, we also need uh, some kind of model of a cell to say which kind of, which, which values of epistasis coefficients are surprising and which are not. Okay, so, so how do we come up with, with a model of, of a cell? And I don't think we can, at this point, we can really do a good job describing uh, the entire cell, but maybe we can try to uh, describe metabolism. So metabolism, of course, is very important, and it's a, you know, it's, it's, uh, many genes are involved in metabolism. So we understand epistasis between metabolic genes, we might have a chance or we might be able to say something, you know, general, maybe. So, 
but metabolism, so one feature of metabolism is that, is that it's complex, right? So, so we need to somehow uh, come up with a model that would tell us what kind of interaction you would observe between two mutations uh, maybe that, that affect maybe very different parts of metabolism. And so how do we do this? And so, so the, the idea uh, that maybe can help us is that uh, we don't need to kind of take this complexity uh, all at the same time. What we maybe can do is, so if, if the mutations really affect very different parts of this network, maybe it doesn't matter what the structure is in these other parts. Maybe we can sort of coarse grain uh, some parts of metabolism, and as long as we know something about these links between modules, maybe we can say some, maybe we can make a prediction uh, or sort of expe ex calculate the expectation of what epistasis should be. So that's sort of the very vague basic idea, but let me try to formalize uh, what I'm trying to do here. So, so imagine that we have a network, and I'm just showing you a very small metabolic network with just four metabolites. So imagine that there is actually a much larger network into which this little network is embedded. So we can group metabolites into, into uh, a module. So this is fairly, ar almost arbitrary, but not quite. I'm not, I'm not going to go into too, de too many details. But let's say we group metabolites into, into, into modules. Uh, I'm going to call the metabolites that are inside of the module as internal, and the ones that are to which these internal metabolites are connected, so these ones, I'm going to call them input-output metabolites. And the, the kind of the feature of the module is that whatever is inside the module does not affect anything outside of the module except for the input-output metabolites. So that's sort of the key feature of the module. So if we, if we make this, uh, if we sort of des designate these modules this way, then uh, we can assume that the internal metabolites are at steady state given the concentration of the input-output metabolites. So this is actually not an unreasonable assumption. So probably metabolic uh, networks are actually most of the time at steady state. At least that's what, that's what people tell me. Uh, so if you do this, so if you, and this is sort of mathematical, now the mathematical fact is that if the internal metabolites are at steady state, then you can replace any module with an effective reaction. So you can just replace that whole com complex module with single reaction between the input-output metabolites. So now the, the rate of this effective reaction might be very complex, but we can do it in principle. So now this module, as I mentioned, is itself embedded into a larger network, right? And then you can continue this procedure as before. So we group, you know, there's a larger module, and we assume that the metabolites are a steady state, then this larger module can also, be, can also become a single, single effective reaction. And so we can, in principle, continue doing this until uh, we have a description of the full cell. And maybe it looks something like that. So nutrients come in, there are some precursors, then we should then convert to amino acids, which are then converted into proteins. And so that might sound like a crazy idea that we can do this. But in fact, Terry Hua's group has shown that E. coli, at least, that grows exponentially is actually described by this kind of effective model, where these processes uh, have constants, sort of numerical constants attached to them, so x1, x2, x3, and growth rate is actually a function of these constants, which, which they derived. So this kind of coarse graining idea might, might actually, well, it should work in principle. OK, so now uh, to make progress with epistasis, we need a couple more assumptions. And let me go through this uh, kind of slowly, and then I think it will be easy. So, okay, so the assumptions that we have to make is, the first assumption is that the kinetics of, our, of, of my reactions are going to be first order. So this is sort of the simplest model that I can think of uh, that is you know, not completely, uh, not, 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 a toy, not a completely insane toy model. But in any case, in, if the reaction rates are first order, then these rate constants are the only parameters that uh, uh, the single parameter, xij, describes the reaction ij, right? So uh, the second assumption is that we have a series of these nested modules where each module has only two input-output metabolites. So think of uh, this little module. So I'm not showing all the reactions inside. There could be lots of in internal metabolites here. I'm just not showing them. But there are only two input-output uh, metabolites. And this the smaller module, mu, is embedded into a larger module, which also has only two 
uh, input-output metabolites. So if we make this assumption, then each module is also described by a single uh, number, which I call Y sub mu, which is the effective rate of the reaction, uh, sort of the, the, the rate of the effective reaction that replaces this module at steady state. And of course, if you do this, uh, if you do the math, uh, these effective rates, of course, are dependent on the uh, actual original uh, rate constants. And so now we have a hierarchy of phenotypes. So you can think of these Ys as effective, as effective phenotypes. So the, sort of this, this is the more, more detailed phenotype, and we, as we keep coarse graining, they become more and more, sort of less and less detailed. So sort of higher and higher level, you can think of them. Okay, so then what, are the, what about mutations? So let's imagine that we have a mutation A, which affects one particular reaction. So we can measure the effect of that mutation A on the rate of the reaction uh, Xij. So this is just the relative, relative effect of that mutation, uh, relative effect of that mutation on that rate. If this reaction is part of a module mu, then of course uh, this mutation will also have an effect on the effective rate of that module, right? So we can also measure the effect of the same mutation now at a sort of uh, uh, at a higher level of description, and we can continue this for all you know all, all our levels of description. And so we're, the assumption that we're going to make, and by the way, so you can do the same for, thing for double mutants, right? So the, so so delta A B is now the effect of two mutations on this on the reaction activity. So. Uh, the, the one technical assumption that we're going to make is that the effects of mutations A and B, we're going to consider only two mutations. They're both small and they have the same sign. So both beneficial or both deleterious. So now what about epistasis? So uh, I'm going to measure epistasis using um, an epistasis coefficient. And this is this, the, the idea of an epistasis coefficient is exactly the same. So let's say this is our true effect of a double mutant on the uh, of, on the rate of reaction Xij, and this sum is the predicted effect based on the single mutations. So this is sort of a standard uh, standard uh, epistasis coefficient. I normalize it, and this is a slightly non-standard uh, 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 denominator. But the reason is is kind of is kind of technical. It it doesn't really matter. It just makes mathematical properties quite nice here. So. Now, what is, what is key to, to, to understand here is that epistasis also can, me, can be measured at, the, at different levels of uh, description, right? So it can be measured at the level of the actual activities, but it can also be measured at the level of the effective activities of different modules. So, and this is what we have. And so the assumption that we're gonna make is just, again, for simplification, that mutations A and B affect two different reactions, in which case, epistasis at the level of the actual activity is going to be zero. This is just to simplify what we find. Okay, so, so let me now show you what, what we can do now with this, with this sort of model. So, so I'm going to ask two questions. So the first question is, what kinds of epistasis would emerge in metabolic networks? So imagine a, meta a metabolic module, uh, and this is the coarse-grained version of that module. So if we have two mutations that affect this module, there's go going to be no epistasis between these mutations because they affect uh, at the level of the actual activities. They affect different reactions. So there's no epistasis at the sort of microscopic description. But if they are in the same module, they might as well affect the effective activity. So we want to ask what kinds of values of this epistasis at the level of effective activity can arise in metabolic networks. And the second question is, suppose now you have uh, this one module that has been already coarse-grained and it's embedded into a larger module mu plus one. So if, this, if we had some epistasis at the level of the smaller module, right? So we know epsilon y mu. So what, what we would like to know is after the coarse graining of this larger module, how, what kind of values will epsilon y mu plus one have? Right? So how does epistasis propagate from lower to higher levels? And so the second question is actually much easier to answer. Here's, here's the answer. So let's say we plot this epistasis at the lower level versus epistasis at the higher level. So this is a diagonal. It's gonna be mapped by a linear map which has an unstable fixed point. 
And what this means, so it, and this fixed point is, it's, it's, what is critical is that fix, this fixed point is between zero and one. And this, this, this statement that the, that, the, that the slope of this line is bigger than one and the fixed point is between zero and one. So these, these features are completely independent of the topology of the networks. So for all topologies, this is gonna be true. And this is a very general statement within this class of models. And so what this means is that if you start with a negative epistasis, let's say you somehow start with two mutations which had a negative epistasis at the lower level. At the higher level, they're gonna have even more negative epistasis. And it's gonna continue, as you keep coarse graining, epistasis is gonna become more and more negative. Similarly, if you start with a strongly positive epistasis, greater than one, same thing is gonna happen. This as you keep coarse graining, epistasis is going to increase in magnitude. Uh, if you start in the middle, between zero and one, we can't say because here uh, things depend on the exact location of this, of this fixed point, which will depend on the kinetic parameters and topology. So one takeaway from this is that uh, certainly epistasis does not disappear. So if it appeared at some level of organization, it's going to still be present at higher and higher levels of organization, including growth rate. Okay, so question number one now, what kinds of epistasis can emerge in these networks. And so to answer this question really briefly, let me just give you an example. So this is a toy network, toy metabolic network, and I'm gonna look at two specific mutations, A and B, and I'm gonna look at these two, at the epistasis between these two mutations at the level of this network uh, as a function of the rate of this third uh, reaction. So we vary, we're gonna vary this reaction rate, so that's Z here on this axis. And as you can see, as we vary this, the, re, the reaction rate of that third reaction, epistasis between these mutations A and B also changes. And it changes from negative values to values that are greater than one. So all three possible regimes of epistasis can emerge even in this simple network. So, uh, and this means that, so this, in addition, this tells us that uh, also, we can see, we can have higher order epistasis. I don't know if, if, if people have sort of heard this, this if, you, if you haven't heard about this, it doesn't matter. If you have heard about this, uh, metabolic networks will naturally generate higher order and environmental epistasis. So if you look now at this plot, you kind of, if you kind of look at it long enough as I did, you will notice that uh, actually there are some patterns in how the, the location of these mutations depends on, or sort of the topological relationship between these mutations determines epistasis. So it's not arbitrary networks have arbitrary epistasis. So what you see is that, for example, if we delete this reaction here, uh, the reaction 1,3 affected by mutation A and the, this reaction 4,5 affected by mutation B, they became parallel, right? And for parallel mutations, as you just saw, epistasis was negative. And this turns out to be a general statement for any mutations that are in a strictly parallel relationship. So like this, epistasis is going to be negative. And what this means is that because, of the, because negative epistasis propagates through, through all the levels of hierarchy, uh, we would expect that negative epistasis will persist even at higher phenotypic levels, including growth rate. And we can make a similar statement for serial reactions. So if the reactions are serial, the affected by mutations are, are in a serial topological relationship, then epistasis between them is going to be greater than one, and it means that uh, any uh, strictly, uh, sort of, uh, strictly serial in interaction will result in a, in a positive uh, or greater than one epistasis, even at the level of growth rate. Okay, so this is, so what this theory generally tells us is that the topological relationships between mutations uh, impose constraints on the value of epistasis that you measure, not necessarily at the, at the level of the little network where it appeared, but even at higher levels of, of organization, for example, at the level of growth rate. Okay, and so uh, let me just close up to finishing, by finishing and uh, by, by sort of staying propositions that I think may be true for general, general uh, metabolic networks. So, I think that one possibility, one possible implication of this, of this work is that epistasis at higher levels of organization might be ubiquitous, right? So because uh, it, doesn't it never disappears. Um, epistasis, higher order environmental epistasis should also be ubiquitous. 
So changing the environment in which you measure epistasis probably matters for a lot of epistasis coefficients that you measure. That's, that's the point. Uh, and finally, the topological relationship constrains what kind of epistasis that you can get. And what this means is that you can maybe go in reverse, right? So if you measure an epistasis matrix, you might actually be able to say something about the topological relationship between mutations, between the reactions that these mutations are, are affecting. And uh, in terms of evolution, I think the implication is that, uh, so it looks like deleterious and beneficial mutations have different statistics of epistasis. That's, that's at least what we see so far. And what this may mean, and I, I don't have proof, but this is a possibility, is that beneficial mutations may be sort of a special kind of mutation. For example, they might be eliminating redundancies as opposed to all, all mutations, uh, as opposed to sort of random mutations. Okay, so this is, I think, all I have to say. I'm sorry that I ran a little uh, over. So I just wanna thank people that were involved in this work. So uh, a lot of the work, mo most of the work that, that I talked about was uh, done by um, uh, grad students, Dan Rice, Elizabeth Jerison, Myla Johnson, and Elena Martzul. And uh, we had some collaborators and funding sources. And um, so thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. And, I think I'm supposed to do this. So, ah, sorry, not good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, um, when you uh, use the model to uh, deal with some empirical networks, it's possible you yeah. don't know uh, completely about the yes. network. Yes. So what if uh, uh, from, uh, well, theoretical network, you randomly remove some uh, yeah. no nodes yeah. or randomly add some things that, uh, that yes. represent some uh, yes. wrong measurements, then will that affect your accuracy in estimating yeah. epistasis? So the, the point of this, of this theoretical work is to exactly try to see how, which features of epistasis will be robust to the specific topology of the network, sort of the specific description of the network versus the features that are just universal, right? And so, so what I showed you is the features that are universal. So now if you, if you add or remove edges, so the, the, this law, this, this sort of, how, how epistasis propagates from lower to higher level will not change because it's completely independent of these specifics, right? So this is just, just really true for all kinds of epistasis. Now, whether, uh, a, so, so let's, let's say you have two reactions that are parallel in a, in a particular network. Now, if you start adding, adding new edges, if you add a new reaction, these two reactions may become, their topological relationship between them might change. So yes, so this kind of, this would be, uh, this is sensitive to the actual structure of the network. Thank you. So some things are and some things are not. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, so my question is regarding uh, your first part. Yes. So when you try to uh, measure the fitness effect in different uh, genetic background, so you can only measure those non-lethal effect. Correct. Right. So yes. what if there is a bias in terms of, I mean, proportion of lethal effect in regarding different, I mean, uh, fitness background. Yeah, so we actually didn't have any lethal mutations in this library, it turns out. Uh-huh. Um, but if, but we, we, did, we, did some, we did some tests for that also, so, so sort of. Essentially, you can look at, um, let me, let, let's, it's, I, will, I don't, I don't want to, go into too many te technical details, and I, I don't remember this super well, but we actually thought about this. And so, so I'm happy to uh, talk to you offline yeah. if, you, if you're interested. So the answer is that it does not, does not, seem, to be in a, does not seem to be a problem. Okay. All right, for the second part, yeah. uh, so does the network have to be all connected? To, to it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be fully connected, but mm -hmm. it has to be. So the the technical assumption, yes, which I actually thank you. I forgot to mention this. So there is a technical assumption that the network has to 
we basically don't want to have metabolites that are that are dangling, that are sort of accumulating indefinitely, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that. So every metabolite has to be connected to to two other metabolites. Essentially, that's 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 the requirement. Yes. Yes. I sort of understand that the results for question one, uh, yes. parallel versus serial yes. connection. Yes. But for question two, is there intuitive explanation why the uh, lower level FSA part of that transmits to the high level? Is there intuitive explanation? OK, so the question is, so in the, we, we have uh, so I, I showed you how epistasis propagates from lower to higher level of organization. And the question is, uh, is there any intuition for why this is the case? Um, I don't think I have a great intuition for it. But, but, I, but I, think, I think the basic, the basic uh, I, I, can try, I can try to say something. OK, so, so this may not be helpful, but, I, but I'll try. So what this uh, result shows is that if you look at the flux, so this, this result is, is equivalent to the following statement, that if you look at the flux through a module as a function of one single reaction in that module, this function is always concave, irrespectively of what the topology is. And I think that, so, okay, so now the question, why is that the case? So I think the way how I understand this is that uh, basically, if you have a if you have a network if you have a network with, with one input and one output, um, increasing the the the, the, re, the rate of one reaction will become sort of less and less uh, will have smaller and smaller effect on flux because other reactions will become limiting. That's that's kind of the explanation that I have. So that, that sort of has to make the function that maps the rate of every reaction onto the flux through the module concave. And that's, that's, where, this, that's where this comes from. OK. Why did you think that? Uh, oh. Sorry. Yeah. Well, you, you started, so. Um, you suggested that maybe beneficial mutations are uh, Eliminating redundancies, or I guess going through parallel changes. Um, why do? Yeah. So, so the the lo Well, so this is just a suggestion, but uh, my thought process was like this, right? So, so we see that in these metabolic networks, both kinds of epistasis can arise, right? Positive and negative, depending on the topology, de depending on the topological relationship. So, it means that the distribution of epistasis coefficients that you would empirically observe would actually depend on sort of how many parallel versus how many serial pairs you have. And that means that it depends on the structure of, of the network in some, in some way. So now, why would beneficial mutations uh, have a different, statistically different structure of epistasis than deleterious mutations in this case? Well, the only, if, you know, if we take this model like too seriously, then the only explanation is that the, uh, they just affect a, different, a certain subsets of, subset of, of reactions. So for example, I mean, one possibility is that there is a lot of serial, there's a lot of serial reactions in this network. And uh, inefficient mutations maybe eliminate these, these unnecessary redundancies. I, I sort of have the same question as George. So effectively, how does that linear map works? How did you derive the relationship? Oh, how do you do, how do you get that? Yes, how did you get get that? I, I understand that that yeah. mapping, but how does that lie? You want to know how you know how, you know you want to know how the how the how you actually get to that result? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm happy to, to to tell you, but I think that's it's oh. just gonna probably not be important for most people. So okay. I, I'm happy to do this after. Yeah. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much, then.